I come from a special family. Not that I expect you to be surprised with that. Wouldn't be very interesting if there wasn't something out of the ordinary about us. I could write you 90 pages on the specifics of what we do, but you're a bunch of smart people, so I'll keep things short. We're hunters, and I don't think I have to tell you I'm not talking about deer and rabbits. It's me, Victor, my brother Norm, and our sister, Tamara. I'll skip over the part where I tell you how sad it is when we lost our parents. They were soldiers, just like us. They wouldn't want us whining about it to strangers online. We sat in our basement, huddled around the 2000s era computer we use when browsing parts of the web not intended for human eyes. Doesn't look like much, but it has a history. Dark and esoteric enough, it almost has a mind of its own. Hasn't failed to keep us safe from prying eyes yet. But I've never been a fan of keeping any kind of tainted object around. When is it going to start working? Tamara says. She's 6'2", and if I said she was built like a linebacker, I'd probably embarrass half the NFL. After you ask that another six times. Norm says. Miserable prick most of the time. Wire thin, always rocking two days of scruff, and usually in need of a shower. I give him hell for that last part, but I can understand why he avoids bathing. Lost four toes as a teenager, something our parents were chasing sent a swarm of god-awful chittering bugs up through our pipes. Left him with a nasty limp, and a hatred of hygiene. And as for me... I kind of want to lie and say I'm a Vin Diesel looking guy, cool scar going down one eye, all that stuff. But truth is, I think, a 30 year old Steve Buscemi who hits the gym five days a week. The screen flickers to life, bringing up a website we're looking for. A tiny woman, a little over five feet, maybe 140 pounds, with tan skin and dark hair sits behind a large, black, oak desk. She wears a sharp business suit. It's tailored perfectly, giving her a powerful, aggressive look, despite her size. You'd assume she was human at first glance, with the exception of those constantly spinning irises. But we know better. We've been tracking her for the better part of three years. She's a child of Hamlin which is pretty much exactly how it sounds. One of the original 36 children taken from their home. Payment for services rendered by the Piper. They say they drowned in the story because the real truth is so much worse. The Piper never wanted payment. He wanted an army. He twisted and warped the children, giving them a piece of himself. And within each of them, that seed grew each child rivaling the Piper in raw connection to the Void. But one was not satisfied with the powers of a mere legend. She wanted more. So she stalked her brothers and sisters, enacting dark rites to strip them of their power, of their souls, and as each one fell, she became more than human, more than monster or demon. She became a force of nature. It's that time of the decade again, super fans. That's right, we at Pretsu are hiring. Do you have the skills needed to be a valued member of my team? Are you sick and tired of waiting weeks or months for proper prey? Well, then Pretsu may be for you. We have six open positions and we will be holding interviews on October 15th from midnight till 3 a.m. Preference will be given to new blood entities and those with current popular presence in the public mindscape. We look forward to seeing all of you there and bringing some new life to the Pretsu team, the woman says. Upbeat outro music plays and with a whimper from deep within the computer, the screen goes black. Son of a bitch. You did it, Norm. Three years, man, and we finally have her. I say clapping my brother on the back. Pretsu, where to begin? 
I'd call it a creepy restaurant, but it's more an arcade with a heavy carnival food theme. Animal makeup is the disguise of choice to cover up the employee's more interesting traits. At least there is an animatronics though, right? It has no fixed location, popping up in random cities, making people think it's been there for years. But Tammy, she cracked the pattern, which we figured out was absolutely useless without a date to sync things up with. But armed with the time, we have a place. For those of you not in the know, a hunter is a technical definition. It's not any idiot that picks up a gun and tries to take revenge for a campsite massacre. Those people are nothing more than angry victims, not hunters. Hunters are born into families with a long history of dealing with the paranormal. So long as their essence, I'd say soul, but that tends to raise hackles and cause a lot of useless debate, has adapted, giving them traits that let them stand in front of the worst monsters the world can throw at them. Norm, he has a way with objects, haunted car, cursed pistol, sentient computer. He's more comfortable talking with them than he is with people he's known for his entire life. Not too shabby with the less intelligent entities either. Tammy, she breaks things. She can grab a ghost, smash a cursed pendant in one hand. And on more than one occasion, I've seen her knock something out that had eaten a grenade moments before. If she's attacking something, the universe seems to rearrange things just a little bit to make it a fair fight. And me, I know things. Not through research, though I do plenty of that. But when I'm looking at something that shouldn't be there, I get little glimpses into its history. If it sounds like I got shafted, well, once upon a time, I did a lot more. But that's a story for another time. We might not be the best in raw power. I've seen folks do shit I'd damn near call magic. But the three of us have been making a bit of a name for ourselves. We work well together, and it shows. Pretzu, that will be our claim to fame. Van Helsing had Dracula. We will have the child of Hamlin. The outside of the building did not hint at the congregation of evil waiting within. We all expected something more sinister. Rusted signs, cracked windows, hell, even just some creepy voice playing over loudspeakers. But what we saw was a legitimately inviting family-friendly barcade type place. Soft neon sign painted windows, and as the name implied, a general zoo-style theme. Tammy kicks in the door, aiming down the side of a massive tactical shotgun. Don't goddamn move. Firing around into the ceiling, Norm and myself walk in a few steps behind, scanning the crowd. I'm armed with a Mac-10, its cheap wire stock tight to my shoulder. Not the best gun on earth, but this one's been a decade between realities. What exactly that means, go ask Norm. And speaking of my brother, he walks in armed with nothing because he's a fucking lunatic. Half the time I can't tell if the crap he pulls is esoteric crazy or just regular, should take him to a shrink crazy. We see 20 or so various entities. They seem to consist of four main groups. I call the first one the Humane Society. Bunch of animal-like things, big, deformed, and nowhere near the werewolf boyfriend I'm sure half of you are thinking. The second was the smoking section. Things that seem to have no real form. Wisps, ghosts, specters, all seem to hang out in a shadowy gloom. The third group I deemed the remains. Rotting ghouls, ghasts, and revenants, staring blankly as we kicked in the door. And finally, there were the new kids. A couple tall, impossibly skinny guys. Faces obscured deep in hoodies. An obese man with a tube television monitor embedded in his stomach. And a few other seemingly slapped together entities. The type of weird shit we see more and more lately. A single ghast, 
a leather-skinned corpse with needle-like fangs, breaks free of the crowd, leaping through the air like a flea. I chuckle slightly. I don't need the paranormal flash to know this thing is young. The fact it seemed to think that we were three random victims told me everything I needed to know. Tammy shrugs off the massive backpack containing our heavy equipment and holds the shotgun with a single hand. The gas starts springing from arcade cabinets, support struts, and even the 20-foot high ceiling, creating an impossible to predict angle of attack. Impossible for most people. Tammy catches it by the back of the neck. It's infectious bite neutralized. It snaps and thrashes like a diseased cat. Without taking her shotgun or her thousand yard stare off the crowd, she kneels, her black tactical gear making her look like a formless, indomitable mountain. She slams the gas into the ground, over and over, not showing a sign of strain as she lifts the hundred kilo beast with one hand. Normally, one needs blessed salt, a ritual knife and a dead man's ash to hurt one of these things. Tammy simply smashed it against the ground like a bag of ice till it tore apart. She stands, still holding a fistful of dripping green flesh in her left hand. She looks no more concerned than if she was addressing a room full of grade schoolers. Norm gets to talk to the really weird stuff, takes one to no one and all that. But Tammy is our negotiator when it comes to the more intellectually inclined entities. She has that Ash Williams, Reggie Bannister confidence neither Norm nor myself cared to cultivate. This can be a bloodbath if everyone wants it to be, but you bunch of scraps and rejected stories are outmatched, and you all know it. You know who we want, and we're not asking you to help us get her, but I highly suggest staying out of our way. As Tammy says this, she takes a few steps forward. The closest entities actually back up. A couple new kids decide to take her up on her offer. Two twenty-something, twitchy, human-looking things with bleach, burned skin, and hunting knives seemingly fused to their right hands. They make it as far as the doorway when a shimmering field of gray light bisects them, one half falling outside of the building, one flopping limply inside before being tossed in a spinning arc as the doors slam shut. And what do we have here? That voice, that upbeat, overconfident, somehow sinister voice. I turn to see her, the child of Hamlin, coming out of a back room, the entities filling this place parting around her. I'm sure the Moses imagery is purposeful on her part. She stands five foot seven, tanned skin, but beyond that, I couldn't guess where she's from. Besides the obvious, it's like her features suggest what I want to see rather than what's actually there. She's wearing a suit again, but this time it's festive, cheerful, a wacky combination of primary colors that gives her the look of walking cartoon character, albeit one that is most certainly in charge. Her hair is shoulder length, a vibrant red-orange that shifts color from one moment to the next, like an undersea creature. I finally take in the space around me. To my left are rows and rows of arcade games, flanked by mirrored walls. Some I recognize, others seem to be custom-made for Pretsu, featuring the same characters plastered over every available space. To my right is a massive indoor jungle gym. Tube slides, ball pits, and any other childhood staple stretches as far as the eye can see. In front of us, flanking the door to the child of Hamlin, came through our various food vendors, all staffed by entities wearing similar uniforms, each themed after a different animal, the costume covering their more obvious paranormal features. And those staff, they weren't the rabble we were about to eviscerate, no, I recognize each one, a legend in their own right. It speaks volumes for the woman pulling the strings. And what do we have here? Is this a group of hunters? How goddamn cute! You've got to tell me the plan. Name's Lisa, by the way. Awesome to meet you. 
she says, walking forward, no fear, just a sense of aloof amusement on her face. We keep you and the freak squad busy until I'm cut off. One moment she was standing maybe 10 feet away from me. Next, she is nose to nose with Tammy. Tammy doesn't waste a second throwing a lightning quick overhand punch that I've seen break skulls and cave in the ribs of anything that goes bump in the night. What I've never seen is something take it without blinking, nor Tammy pulling her hand back. A twisted, bloody mess, torn up far worse than she could have done by her own force alone. She screams, and I feel a cold pit start to form in my stomach. I look to the backpack. It holds all of our heavy equipment. I catch Lisa's eye and she smiles, flicking her wrist delicately, mockingly. The massive, armored tactical bag sails through the air, shrinking as it goes, eventually disappearing entirely with a small popping noise. Tammy is trying to hide her pain, but no one keeps a stoic expression with one hand looking like a shredded steak. She's bleeding out, fast. My mind scrambles for an escape plan. Please, just keep being the most dramatic person ever, Lisa says, dripping disdain. She grabs Tammy's hand and with a sound like melting ice, the compound fractures sink below the skin. The wounds seal. It's still broken, likely needs to be amputated, but no longer life-threatening at least. Now, can I fucking talk or do I need to kill one of you right off the bat to get your attention? Lisa clears her throat. Suddenly, her voice is booming over the loudspeakers, addressing the entire room. <clears throat> now, on one hand, I see a business full of monsters that couldn't find the courage to attack three humans. And on the other hand, three humans too stupid to do a little research beyond bluntly pirating a couple videos of mine. All of you failures should be ashamed of yourselves. But I'm bored. So I'll give everyone a chance to stop sucking. Isn't that great? Sun's up in five hours. Any one of you sewer-dwelling new blood rodents who brings me one of the hunters, you and your friend get a job. That's the job of your dreams, and one hell of a favor from whoever you gift the job to. You hunters, you survive. You get to walk out of here regroup and come back with a better plan. To make things interesting, the staff will be prowling around, being neutral. I suggest all of you to avoid them. They are as bored as I am, just not as creative. Oh, and Tamara? Because you thought you could put your hands on me? I'm dropping in a handful of civilians. We were all in shock. We expected power, but but this, we couldn't have expected this. This isn't legend or myth. This is a bullshit tall tale told after drinking Sterno that I'm somehow actually living through. She starts to walk back, slowly laughing to herself as if we were nothing more than children. You have 30 minutes before the game starts. I wouldn't suggest trying anything to each other before that is the last thing Lisa says before the lights dim, and an upbeat theme song begins to play over the loudspeakers. Entities scatter, staff move like sharks, scanning, picking out the weakest, a good portion not moving their steel gaze from us. I like her. Norm says in his space cadet tone. Shut the hell up, Norm. Tammy replies. Just saying, she's got style. Norm starts looking around. I want to shake him out of it, but I know he's working. In his own way. That way. He says, pointing to one of the mirrored walls of the arcade. Norm might be out in left field, but I've had to trust him with my life since I was a kid. We sprint toward the wall. Tammy and myself stop dead. Norm, though, just keeps walking straight through one of the mirror panels. We follow, finding ourselves in a room the size of a football stadium. Arcade games, some 20 to 30 feet high, create a maze of blind passages, flashing lights, and random, deafening electronic noises. What I don't see is any entities following us in. Chalk another one up for Norm. 
We walk deep into the maze, memorizing the twists and turns, hoping to get an advantage on whatever raging thing first comes after us. Our inventory is thin. My MAC-10, the shotgun, a handful of rounds and shells, a couple knives, and an emergency first aid kit. Norm has a couple of trinkets on him, but neither me nor Tammy have any idea what use they may or may not have. What's the plan, Tammy? I ask, looking at my watch. Five minutes till things start in earnest. We bunker down here till we get hit. Once shit gets too thick, we fall back to that playground. Then we hope Norm can tell us if there are any nasty surprises in there. You getting anything friendly right now, Norm? Tammy has collected herself. She's all business, even with her injury. Too many voices to hear anything clearly right now. Everything here is so interesting. Norm is smiling, the exact opposite, loving every second around hundreds of paranormally charged objects. And how do we deal with the civilians? I ask, knowing someone has to broach the question. One of those rotters gets a hold of them? We've got that many new things to deal with. Tammy's tone is flat. But I know her. She never likes going scorched earth. You guys understand this is probably our last fight, right? Norm says, out of the blue. The seconds of silence feel like hours. He's not wrong, though. Might as well go out trying to help. Is that what you, of all people, are getting at? I say to Norm, shaking my head. He smiles at me, almost as if to say, Am I wrong, though? He wasn't. The twisted contest starts. Lights turning harsh, music shutting off, leaving only the tuneless noise of the arcade machines. And the screams. I can tell they are human. Not what I wanted to have to deal with right off the bat. I'm no scumbag. We do what we do to save people from having their lives cut short by pure evil. But some part of me was hoping the civilian issue would sort itself out before we had to get involved. Tammy was already following me. Norm, his jiggling joysticks, pressing random buttons and shaking misshapen machines. She grabs him by the shoulder, forcing him to keep up. Something is following us. Tammy says after a couple minutes of walking toward the sound of people. It smells dry. Keep your head on a swivel. We stop at a blind corner, spotting the group. As much as we live for this hero shit, an ambush is likely. Eight adults, no pattern I can see. We have a couple in their 60s, in their Sunday best. He wears a brown suit that's old but well kept up. She wears one of those fuzzy looking sweaters people always swear are expensive, and a pair of green pants. Four guys in their mid-twenties, bit of an edge to their look, but clean shaven and well groomed. They obviously know each other. Friends, bandmates maybe? I notice one guy, a tall white dude, nervously spinning a guitar pick. One guy stands naked, looking more confused than the rest. His hair is wild and he keeps pinching himself. I quickly realize he thinks he's sleeping. Finally, a small girl, no more than six years old. She cries, sitting on the ground, her face buried in the crook of her arm. The group is arguing, throwing accusations, making theories. We easily walk up to them unnoticed. The guy with the guitar pick throws a punch. Thankfully for him, I'm more merciful than the demon running this place. His fist connects with my chin. I nod to him, like I'm acquiescing a point. He backs up. I stop, putting up my hands. Totally ruining this peaceful gesture is Tammy holding her shotgun at waist level, trained on the crowd. That one is for free. I'm sure you guys are scared. The next one, though, that costs you. No questions, no debate. We are the good guys. Anything else is slow death. I say. Tammy is good with spooky shit. I'm better with people. And how do we know we can trust you? The old man says, protectively standing in front of what I assume is his wife. Guess I'm not as good with people as I thought. Victor, in about three seconds, something is coming out of that machine to your right. Norm says, so casually, I almost didn't register it. I back up, watching as the flashing blue light from within the cabinet dimmed. 
then died. I see a massive yellowed skull, empty eye sockets and haphazardly filled teeth push out of the arcade cabinet. An eight-fingered skeletal hand is next, crawling, almost spider-like from the machine. We call them house warmers, older than the Bible and full of tricks beyond their massive bone frames. Once upon a time, some sick bastards made 23 of them. Maybe six are left roaming the world today, but that's plenty. They can travel through any kind of cabinet, box, or doorway. Their favorite hunting grounds are newly occupied homes or businesses. But in a pinch, they are not picky hunters. The crowd panics, staring sheep-like at the ten-foot, chattering creature. It hesitates for a moment trying to decide if we are a threat. It grabs the old man in a flash, seeing us as nothing but more time-consuming prey. It pulls the old man apart, blood and gore hitting the ground in a torrent. A horrible inhaling noise comes from somewhere within the creature's chest. I wish I didn't know that was the thing stopping the man's essence from moving on. It pays for that, though. Tammy tosses her gun to Norm and draws a hurl bat, an ancient Germanic weapon. It's nothing more than a large sharpened rectangle of steel, but the one she carries strapped to one leg has been tasting the blood of demons and cultists since bronze was new. The housewarmer's jaw explodes into fist-sized chunks, the bone around it beginning to crumble and rot. It leaps at Tammy, hands outstretched. Norm and I step to the side. It's faster than it has any right to be, Tammy is wrapped in both massive bone claws and a blink. But that armor she wears isn't just for show. One thing you learned real quick in our line of work is that even the biggest person is a jello-filled sack to an entity of sufficient size. It kneels, shaking her like a murderous parent as veins of rot and cracks begin to creep down its shoulders. Any time here, guys? Tammy yells. Norm and I fire in unison. The house warmer is suddenly a double amputee, Tammy dropping like a brick, but still landing on her feet. She breaks one claw from the hand, clocking it back like a javelin. The creature backs up, suddenly blind as its eye sockets start to dissolve. The sharpened bone spike pierces the skeleton's ribcage, and with a scream that I can feel, the thing falls apart. On the move, now, I tell the shocked crowd. A demand and a warning all at once. Over the next half hour, we move at half speed, hearing more and more entities come in and begin searching for our unlucky little group. For their part, the civilians remain quiet, probably too shocked to do anything stupid. Abominations that cross the line between thing and animal are universally silent. Their forms may be asymmetrical, weeping pus and blood covered in scabs and clawed limbs, but they could be walking on a light bulb strewn floor covered in pop rocks and you'll never hear them coming. The first stands at one end of a long corridor of machines. It's a lanky thing, looking like a furless bipedal coyote. It grins, skinless lips weeping thin blood. The second blocks us in from the opposite direction. This one is a massive quadrupedal fusion of man and boar, easily as tall as Tammy. Blunt, molar-tipped tusks jut from its jowl-laden face. The rest, in their motley forms, stare at us from the tops of the cabinets. This type of situation is exactly why we carry around the backpack. Without it, it feels like suddenly finding oneself in a pitcher plant. What's the percentage? Norm asks. It's Code. He's telling me he has a way out of the situation. He's also telling me it's high cost. And finally... He's asking me how many civilians drop before a plan like that becomes viable. I look around. The last of the crew where things died out back in the 50s, and as I scan the group of runts and rejects hovering over us, I don't see any close cousins. About 50. Less if that boar is worse than it looks. I reply. I couldn't describe the brutal scrum blow by blow if I tried. The things on the machines leapt down blood flew. Trapped in that close, no one laid down and died, though. Nowhere to run makes people a lot braver than they think. Tammy wreaked havoc, every edge of her body a weapon. 
She severed limbs and crushed skulls faster than the things could grow them back. Norm seemed to know when everything was going to happen moments before it did, pushing civilians to safety, dodging sure death, all while staring intently at the flashing games most of the time. Me, I took my shots when I could. I shouted out targets when I got a flash of insight, and as a long yellow claw burrowed into my left eye, I wished for the millionth time my own blessings didn't get muted all those years ago. Two of the band members die. They manage to grapple the coyote thing, drag it to the ground, and snap its neck. They couldn't hear me telling them to keep going over the den of the battle. The two men only knew they were dying when they saw the tiny, almost delicate fist burst through their chest. Mercifully, the old woman didn't see it coming at all. A backhanded blow that sent Tammy crashing into the wall of arcade machines took her head from her body before she knew what happened. I didn't see the naked man die, only saw his body after the fact. Whatever happened to him was the work of a handful of creatures. When Norm saw me clutching my eye, the creature that did it dying of a couple dozen glowing red bullet wounds. He gave me a look that let me know he was doing his thing. He closes his eyes for a moment. I fend off claws and snapping fangs, having no clue what he's pulling off, but knowing he needs time to do it. He whispers something I have no hope of hearing and nods solemnly. With a wave of breaking glass, Neon blue hands spring forth from the machines, grasping the bestial things assaulting us. Their touch seems to wrap the creatures, their flesh seeming to become unstable. They claw and trash, bite and curse, but the thing's hands slowly drag each one into the humming arcade machines. Unlike the house warmer, though, their progress is brutal, shaving off flesh, breaking bone, and causing the tortured screams of creatures thought incapable of true pain. The corridor, toppled machines, blinking lights, shattered glass, is silent. Four civilians, three hunters, bloodied, beaten, but alive. One machine, still standing, starts to open down the middle, creating a doorway of blue light. I try to look within but get a blinding headache. Norm begins to walk toward it. Jesus, Norm, what did you do? Tammy says, stepping in front of him. I made a deal, Tammy. I said it earlier. This isn't the time to hold out. I did what I had to do to save us. Norm says, more lucidly than I've seen him in a long time. Fuck them. Who cares if you made a deal? The one look I got at the doorway lets me know exactly why Norm cares if it breaks this deal. Not everything powerful is old. What is in these machines has a deep current of power and a mind young enough to be petty with it. She doesn't try stopping him. Not really. It's just instinct to rage against war's price. Norm looks to me for a moment before he steps into that abyss. I'm sorry about what happened to you, Vic. I should have seen it coming. It was my job. He says. Before I can reply, he walks into the doorway. It slams shut like a gallows door, doing God knows what to my kid brother. Looks like the score is one to zero hunters. Two more strikes and you're out. That bitch's voice says over the loudspeakers. But this is a game you were always going to lose, ever since you first stumbled onto my existence. I stopped having to worry about your kind when I was still hunting down my siblings. When I made the choice to stop being a monster and start being a goddamned legend. But even then, that wasn't enough. Legends do die, legends fade. I learned to take strength from blood and flesh, soul and emotion. But true power, it doesn't come from the cattle you call brother. It comes from the void born. So I fought, I learned, I begged, and I prostrated myself before old gods and new powers. I then became an eater of legends. I learned to change, to adapt, to take and use and turn every bit of the world to my advantage. But I'll let you in on a little secret. I'm not done yet. I've had my fill of legends. 
I'm on my way to consume the divine. You think you can get in my way? I'm an unstoppable fucking force, Victor! You are a pretentious Elmer Fudd. Static squealing ends the taunt. The scary thing is, she isn't lying. I'd know if she was. Two hours in and the maze is a running battle. The staff, bored, or unleashed wade into groups of entities. No half-breed, no-name beasts here, no dirt common dregs, just beings that bring to mind Jack the Ripper, Bloody Mary, gleefully ending the lives of their lesser ilk. We lose the naked man on the trek back to the tube slides and ball pits. Something dressed in a plague doctor coat and wearing a cheap badger-themed half-mask spewed a caustic substance at the man. We ran, not quick enough to avoid hearing the noise of the creature consuming the flesh paste the man was rapidly turning into, though. Without Norm, we enter the playground blind. For all we know, it could eat people and shit cyanide, but sooner or later, if we stay out in the open, something is going to decide we are a better prize than a few monster pelts. The plastic tunnels are cramped and smell of piss. Tammy and I are at the front, the little girl behind us, and the remaining two band members bringing up the rear. Every noise from outside, every thump of a body hitting the structure stops us dead. Civilian, hunter, child, we are all simply caught up in this carnal house. There are no heroes anymore. We come to a large rectangular room, tall enough to at least sit in comfortably. One bubble plastic window looking out on the carnage below. You guys are monster hunters? One of the men, an Indian guy with a lip ring and short green hair, says. I laugh. <laughs> Not at the moment. Right now, you and that right cross that did nothing to that cat thing are as much of a demon slayer as I am. I finish my sentence by ripping off a piece of his shirt and packing my freely dripping eye socket. The girl is crying again, face buried in her arm. The other man, a pot-bellied guy with a faux hawk, puts an arm around her. An hour passes. So far, so good. The staff have taken to crediting effigies and totems of the corpses of the other entities. I'm hungry, the girl says, her tiny voice echoing through the empty tubes and cheap plastic. I had two seconds to save the faux hawk's guy's life. Not being able to stand, let alone get any kind of leverage, makes this impossible. She looks at me, and I see it. The deep black orbs for eyes, the pointed teeth, the sudden blurring of her form. She wrenches the man's arm from its socket, smashing it into my face. Tammy tries to scramble over, but part of her tactical suit gets caught in a plastic seam. The guy is in too much shock to fight back. He stares at his spurting shoulder in disbelief. Those piranha-like teeth tear open the man's throat next, the spray coated the inside of the tiny room. The floor is a pool of hot blood. I slip, landing flat, as she leaps upon the second man. The Mac-10 ran out of ammo back in the arcade. I fire five shots from the backup revolver into the dead-eyed child. Might as well have been throwing snowballs. Tammy is wrenching at the plastic, but the steel hook won't budge. The dark-skinned man holds the child as far as he can, but inch by inch she wears him down. One of his wrists break, her tiny hands crushing it like a paper straw. Fuck! I say, aiming at the plastic bubble and firing my last shot. A dinner plate-sized hole blows out of it, large cracks forming over the rest of its surface. I hope it's enough. I get to my knees and throw myself at the child. She turns like a viper, grabbing me by the collar. Exactly what I wanted. Guess the universe can't be a bastard 24 hours a day, can it? I grab her forearms and within an awkward twisting lurch that tears half the muscles in my back, I throw us both out of the window. Plastic gives, but not before tearing long gouges in both of us. We fall somewhere around 15 feet, but I'm ready. I hit the ground, breaking one wrist, but landing on the black-eyed kid. The blunt trauma pulps its insides and those eyes go from deep black to a dead, lifeless gray. I stand, 
my left knee loose and wobbling. I see staff and lesser entities look at me from every angle, stopping their fighting to see this new development. They began to close ranks, surrounding me. I reach in a pocket and pull out a switchblade that used to be owned by James Dean. He was one of us, and he sure as hell didn't get killed by a sharp turn. I've got one good hand, one good leg, and one good eye. With a massive crash beside me, I have one good soldier to back me up. I hear a shell rack into the scatter gun from up in the equipment, and I hope we have one good marksman. I look around the room, and as I do, I get the largest flash in a decade. A psychic shock so massive, so powerful, and so detailed it seems to slow down time. Almost all of the entities left are new blood. Entity types that have only sprang up in the past few decades, and even then, it's the runts, the kids, the old, or the frail. They were not stalking the weak. The staff, her minions, were taking the choicest cuts. This wasn't a trap for us. This was something so much more. This was something enacting a plan decades in the making. This is a ritual, a rite, a way to make all of this slaughter more than even the sum of its parts. I can't comprehend the complexity. Rituals to me are some corpse ash and sulfur. This weaving of ethereal powers. This is the work of a demigod. They come on in droves, the runts, the crippled, the things that are left. The staff stand back. This dark performance already too far gone to stop. Tammy wades through them. In a fair universe, she'd have been allowed to kill these things one by one and walk out without a scratch. But the universe isn't fair. And each glancing blow, each ghostly hand passing through her, wore her down a little more, spilled a little more blood that was in short supply. I did my best to help. The knife practically had a mind of its own, but my collarbone is cracked, my gait is uneven, and my remaining eye is starting to lose focus from lack of blood. Our last charge dies with a gurgling scream, something finally having the brains to crawl into the rank playground after him. Tammy tosses off her torn and useless tactical vest, down to a loose-fitting green shirt and a set of brass knuckle dusters. There's about a half dozen things left, all looking as torn up as we are, but Tammy never gets the chance to save the day. Tammy drops the black knuckles. She's held fast. I hear a psychic hum as Lisa walks over, the very air thick with dark potential. I'm not describing what the thing did to my sister, other than to say she did it without lifting a finger, and it left her a twisted, screaming wreck. She broke her body and her mind, flaying both while she spoke to me. Saw everything just that second too late, eh, Vic? You are lucky, though, because you came along right about as I need a message delivered, she says handing me two pictures. One, a pretty but severe looking woman in her thirties. Lots of tattoos, short hair. The other, it takes me a moment to realize is the same woman, but rotten, twisted, covered in almost alive looking tattoos. You find things. Go find her. She has something that belongs to me, but she is a little difficult to contact. That is, Lesson learned on your part. Don't feel too bad, sweetie. Mike Tyson can't knock out a hurricane. You go patch yourself up. Go be Mike Tyson again. Stop worrying about the weather. She grins and turns to a massive patchwork staff member. Its elephant headgear makes what happens next all the more surreal and soul-crushing. Bring that mess on the floor back to the lab. I think I might have a use for it. I turn and leave, knowing I have no choice but to do as Lisa asked, trying to drown out the sounds of Tammy being dragged away for God knows what. <laughs>